I love countdowns. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Main engine start. Houston. Houston. Liftoff. Yes, we have liftoff. All right, I'm Dave Tutt. I am the annoyer in chief of the buffer boat effort. And I have been working for the last five years of my life on speeding up the edge of the internet using a variety of techniques. Uh, the core technique is called CODL, applied with something called FQ CODL, which is now the default in many an operating system, including OpenWRT. But applying that algorithm, or those ideas and those that algorithm, to Wi-Fi has proven to be difficult so far. Uh, and I'm going to go into why it's been difficult and how we intend to finally apply the same techniques to Wi-Fi and why. So I'm going to give a talk on how to reduce induced latency on Wi-Fi. And if I have time, we'll talk a little bit about how the CODL and FQ CODL actually work. And if we still have time, I'm looking for about 10 volunteers for a demo. So if you would be interested in uh, emulating some Q-theory and packets, please raise your hand. And I see one, two, three. I need 10 volunteers for a demo later on in the talk. Sorry? I can't hear you over the child. Do you need only 10 volunteers or someone with a notebook? No, I need people to stand up and act like packets. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yay! All right, so only if I have time, and uh, yes, I have my stick. So we have a problem in Wi-Fi in particular in that we have fixed length queues that stay the same no matter what the rate is. And what you see here in this plot, that Wi-Fi data is naturally very noisy, so it's hard to pull out a clear graph, is that you see that this, this red line here is the ping, going simultaneously with the bandwidth. The bandwidth here is about 30 megabits, and the latency being observed on the link is about 60 milliseconds. Over here is the milliseconds, over here is the bandwidth. And when the rate control increases, in this case to, what is it, 30, 5, 36, you'll see that the latency dropped enormously. And then when the rate dropped again to something like that, the latency increased again and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, these sorts of rate swings are very common in Wi-Fi and the kind of latency and jitter you experience from that is one of the reasons why Wi-Fi can be quite annoying. If your steering wheel worked this way half the time and then the other half the time went like this, a lot of people would die. You just have to have more predictable latency. So, this is another test against real data. Uh, the source from here is from Toki's uh, The Good, the Bad, and the Wi-Fi, just recently published in Computer Networks. And the algorithm that we've come up with, called FQ CODL, is capable of reducing induced latencies by mm, down to 10 or 20 induced milliseconds when you have load on the link. What we had until a few years ago with, um, in the Linux kernel was FIFO queues, which meant as the uh, data rate went down, the duration of delay in this particular test would go up to 500 milliseconds. We fixed that. Uh, it's a couple of new algorithms. This is CODL over here, cutting it to about 200 in this case. FQ CODL getting it to 10 or 20. But yet, in Wi-Fi, we still have this intrinsic 100 milliseconds of delay built into the drivers themselves. And this is relative to the actual rate. I'm at 40 megabits here. If I went to 4 megabits, this white space here would grow out to a second for 4 megabits. This is one of the reasons why Wi-Fi can be annoying. So what we're proposing to do in the next few months is rip out all this latency built into the device driver layer of the Wi-Fi stack. Uh, I have to do the buffer bloat one. Who here has already heard of buffer bloat? Yes. Five years ago, it was zero. <laughs> but I still do have to do a bit of background. Um, bandwidth does not equal speed. If I send you a carton of stuff really slowly, you still get like a lot of data, but it's not fast. Um, if I send you stuff really fast, 
That's really what speed is, latency, lag kills. So, I am right here. Uh, the IETF uses Wi-Fi extensively, but they don't have no real interest in it. Um, I've been working with BufferBloat.net to take the algorithms we developed and deployed on DSL, etc., to uh, apply to Wi-Fi. It's called Make Wi-Fi Fast. Um, we have support all the way up to DAD. Vent Surf has really been uh, very hot on fixing BufferBloat across the internet and been very supportive. And um, the experience thus far with the initial deployment of 802.11ac has been really, really dismal. They weren't paying attention to the Q theory in designing that Mac either. And it would be great to get a grip on what's going on in the next version of the standard. So I got a question for you. When is a good time to drop packets? Do you think holding on to a packet for 16 seconds is a good idea? Raise your hands. How about a second? A half a second? A quarter of a second. Oh, I saw one. 100 milliseconds. We should hold on to a packet for 100 milliseconds. Yeah. Um, most of our protocols were designed that one time around the Earth was enough. And here on this particular train, as you're speeding away at 200 kilometers per hour, we are going around the Earth 60 times in the last few feet of the connection. Not a good thing. I'm going to skip that intro. So, when we first started working on reducing this problem, we mostly noticed it on edge gateways, which typically run at lower speeds than Wi-Fi. So you have a 20 meg megabit downlink from a Comcast or somewhere, and uh, when you did a big download, all of a sudden your latency would climb, in this particular test, by uh, 100 milliseconds to the, the baseline latency in this test was about 100 milliseconds. We did a big download, and we got three quarters of a second of latency induced. So, this particular problem, this inverse relationship between bandwidth and delay, um, has existed in the design of the internet for over 100 and, uh, sorry, over 50 years, the entire duration we've known. Uh, we had some solutions that appeared in the early 90s, um, but they were not widely deployed because they were too hard to use. So, when we started BufferBloat.net, we got a lot of the Early founders of the internet involved Vince Cerf, Van Jacobson, Kathy Nichols, Jim Geddes, Eric Raymond, tons and uh, 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 tons and tons of people. Uh, Fred Baker, uh, I, just the list goes on and on because we were really tired of seeing this. And in 2002, um, Cottle and, uh, sorry, Kathy Nichols and Van Jacobson published an algorithm that could dynamically adjust the rate to the bandwidth available, even on a varying scale. So we proved, theoretically back then, that if your rate varied from, let's say in this particular case, it's hard for me to see these things from here. So in this particular case, we go from 100 megabits with very little latency to 10 megabits, and you see the latency stay uh, flat. And you go to really, really slow one megabit. All of our algorithms failed except Cottle. And we drop back and forth. So the Cottle algorithm is the first one that can notice when our link rate changes and dynamically adjust how much data is going through there to maintain low latency for your flows with minimal packet loss. Now I have to do TCP 101, and I'm hoping that you've all heard of buffer bloat, that I can get you all to cry out at once and tell me what this line right here means when TCP happens. Ready? Tell me what that line is. Well, that's a start. No, what's it called? No, sort of. It's called slow start. It's not very slow. It, the purpose of slow start is to kind of like clear a path to see how much bandwidth is available. And it scales up in sending packets exponentially until it gets to a drop or something called SS threshold. At which point, it reverts into this mode, which is called... Is part of it. Avoidance. Yes, over there, hat tip to Jonathan. Congestion avoidance mode, which is much more gradual. It gets a drop, it drops the rate in half, it increases it again, and so on. This is called the CTCP sawtooth. And if we didn't have this when the internet collapsed in 1986, it would have stayed collapsed until Van Jacobson fixed it that time. 
So when you have tons and tons of flows on the internet, um, they are all following a sawtooth pattern, attempting to probe for maximum amount of bandwidth and yet share the link fairly with other flows. The problem is, let me go back to that slide, some of these have my notes here, is that the response time to a loss takes longer and longer as you add delay. So the bigger your buffers are, the longer it takes to notice a longer it takes to notice that uh, there has been a loss and it's time to reduce the rate. So a single connection will fill any size buffer in front of all the past bottleneck. And given time, given time, adds one packet per act to the buffer. Timely dropping or marking of packets is utterly necessary for the correct operation of the internet. Zero packet loss is not a goal. There's one exception to that, which I'll mention, called ECN. But the goal in life is to respond quickly to packet loss and to have the rate change. It turns out that in terms of TCP, it's not actually the bandwidth that matters. It turns out it's the round trip time that is the most thing that correlates to the speed of how you feel a connection happens. You have the SIN attempt, you have the acknowledgement that comes back, you do an SSL negotiation, that goes a couple transactions back, you say, ooh, can I have some data? Ooh, you get a burst of data, now you've got a need for bandwidth, and then you say thank you and, and log out. But each of those things requires a round trip time, and while it's bound by the speed of light, until fairly recently, it was also bound by queue size. If you start sending packets at more than one time around the Earth, all of our protocols start sending more packets. So if you're already bottlenecked at 250 milliseconds, you can see TCP resetting here and saying, oh, give me some more, some more data, something's going wrong. Well, okay, give me some more data, give me something wrong. And in this particular trace from uh, Fred Baker, I think it went out to seven seconds of delay. And what we really want in the internet is something measured in microseconds or milliseconds. So the good news is with the application of this particular set of theories, CODL and FQ CODL, we fixed it. We've made it possible for the speed of the internet, what we feel when you touch something and something happens, the snappiness of it, to stay relatively fixed. And we fixed it on Ethernet and cable and DSL and fiber. And uh, we've fully, it's getting more and more fully deployed by the day. It's the standard in OpenWRT, as I mentioned. It's the standard in Fedora. We're happy about that. But we have not managed to fix it on Wi Fi yet. Yes, sir? Does the previous slide imply that there are patterns on PIE? I'm sorry, what? Are you implying here that there are patterns on PIE? Is that what you mean in this slide? Patents on? PIE. Pi. Pi. Oh, Pi was, is patented, yes. If it is standardized, it will become uh, freely available to everyone. Okay, yes. Um, so here were some measurements that we'd taken before we started applying this algorithm to everything. Uh, Wi-Fi, typical conference environment, was speaking at things like six seconds. DSL, second and a half, two, three seconds. Fiber, most of the fiber stuff that we've been seeing is actually pretty good. It's only got about 100 milliseconds of intrinsic delay. And DOCSIS 2 modems were exhibiting about a quarter of a second, and DOCSIS 3 modems up to two seconds. Another way to look at it, by the way, I'm using the Flint tool here to produce these plots. I have to explain this one. This is four TCP download streams competing simultaneously with four TCP upload streams. As I mentioned with TCP, the goal is for each flow to pretty much take its portion of the link. And because we have over a quarter second of latency here, it takes over 30 seconds, oh, sorry, it takes over 20 seconds for these flows to get to an equal share of the link. And there's lots of chaos and carnage here on the upload flows. To where an exact same test, an exact same modem, merely by applying the FQ CODL related algorithms, we got to where the streams started up almost instantly to share the full bandwidth of the link. In this particular case, we were applying prioritization, so you might want to deprioritize your BitTorrent a little bit, prioritize your VoIP a little bit. It's so all really share. And we're using the full capability of the link with only about 10 milliseconds of induced delay. 
That's from a quarter of a second down to 10. It turns out that if you continue to optimize for round trip time, this is where we were three years ago. For a page load taking 14 seconds under a particular load to where we are now, to where no matter what the load is, we managed to do it incredibly quickly. An awful lot of work has gone on in the Linux kernel. I have a confession. I am a lousy Linux kernel programmer. It's on tape now. I'm pretty good at theory. I can do models, uh, analytics. But uh, the Linux kernel scares me. And there's a whole crew that's been mostly working for Google, but also Red Hat and volunteers throughout the globe to make huge advancements in reducing buffers and, re and improving latency across the internet. This particular slide just has stuff up to Linux 3.17. We're now at 4.2. And we are doing well. So I just hear there. And as a result of this breakthrough algorithm, we got into the IETF and formed a working group. And nearly all the drafts and all the standards are, are very close to being complete. And we hope that we'll just be able to say, is your product RFC XYZ compliant? I'm sorry, I don't want to buy that. But the bad news is, of course, that the latency problems on Wi-Fi are not just buffer bloat. And after we got the isochronous stuff working well, we started revisiting what it would take to actually get these sort of improvements, orders of magnitude of improvement in latency into the Linux Wi-Fi stack. And how do we do it with the new AQM technologies? How do we cope with packet aggregation in particular? There's a thing called EDCA scheduling, which is kind of random as to how it determines which standards, uh, which stations get the broadcast. And we're in a world where Wi-Fi continues to expand exponentially. There was something like 340 million new uh, hotspots predicted to exist in the next two or three years. Uh, everybody here has, how many of you have more than five Wi-Fi wi devices in your home? More than 10. <laughs> More than 20? I have 60. Got you beat. <laughs> but uh, we anticipate this trend to continue, and yet most of our benchmarks are designed to talk from one client to one station, and we say, yes, we achieved 300 megabits and we're done. And yet we have all these devices in play, and I'm going to try to show, using a demo with the volunteers later, assuming we have time, uh, why aggregation does not work when you have multiple stations transmitting. So um, after we developed FQCADL, it turned out that we started having numbers that were so small that we didn't know how to benchmark them anymore. And in particular, Toki Hoyland Jurgensen, stand up, has been developing tools to let us look at latency under load and give them applause, too. To let us look at latency under load under a variety of circumstances that have not been adequately explored by the industry standard benchmarks. Um, so we started looking at each aspect of the Wi-Fi stack. First up is the uh, improvement to the minstrel rate selection algorithm. And I have to look at my list here. And we're going to try to rework the stack to do per station queuing and deal with 802.11e a bit better. And once we have those two basics in play, and a basic proof of concept, we should be able to show that multi-station improvements, order of magnitude improvement in both performance and latency in that case. And then we can start adding in these really nifty new algorithms. So as I mentioned, Flint is out there. Um, I've done a, most of the work here in a project called Serawart, which is now dead. Everything they put in Serawart is now in OpenWRT. There's still work going on, such as Jonathan's Cake. And uh, we haven't... Serawart was cool in that it had came by default with the GUI, and it worked well with the one platform we did, and therefore we could get n more normal users to actually try it as we iterated. And I was always getting, putting out releases that might have been a little buggy, saying, uh, this re release might eat small children. And people would install it anyway and said, but nope, my kids survived. But I found another bug. Uh, but anyway, that work's been largely wrapped up. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about the things we can finally put pouring into Wi-Fi that are partially an outgrowth of this work. Who here is familiar with Minstrel? Who here has read the paper on Minstrel? That paper never could get past academic review. And it's a shame because that was, it has turned out that three Kiwis doing a war drive in 2006, the rate control algorithm that they developed then, is now in billions of devices. And it isn't well enough understood. And people really need that as a grounding and starting point. Recently, I convinced Andrew to let me leak that paper um, after he revises it a bit more. And that can give us a starting point for discussing Minstrel. But in particular, we came up with two things uh, to improve so recently. Um, and again, this is joint effort. Thomas, I can't pronounce his last name. Hoon? Uh, yes. Did, it's probably the most uh, biggest advance on Minstrel we've had since 2006. It's called Minstrel Blues. It is coupled power and rate control. It makes no sense if your laptop is here and your AP is here to broadcast at a watt. Zip. And we have problems with increasingly dense networks, so it makes sense to try to find the right rate and the right amount of power just to get this far, which will improve spatial reuse and let us have denser systems that won't be able to hear each other when they don't want to. Um, I'm a little concerned about this work um, in that uh, some of your assumptions on the mesh protocols may not interact uh, well with the idea of something that's going to be dynamically lowering the power whenever it can. And that's an area for future work. Mr. Blue is mostly about reducing the power of Unitas because that should work perfectly fine with the mesh protocol. I, well, unless you are trying to get more unicast to cut, out, cut down the amount of multicast. Um, I would like very much, however, to see beaconing and a few other uh, aspects of multicast to be cutting the power dynamically as well. Uh, one way to do that, for example, is that we can look at all the stations that are, uh, we have unicast to recently and we could up the multicast rate to that dynamically and see what breaks. And I'm sure a lot of older devices will break if we do that. But all the same, with the densities going up and with all the comp... Who here has heard of LTEU? Uh, that was not discussed here. Um, that is a very scary thing the carriers are attempting to grab some 5 gigahertz bandwidth. And uh, there was two very good analyses by Cable Labs and by Google regarding how much it actually interferes with Wi-Fi on the gig 5 gigahertz band. That may be another political battle left to fight. I'm sorry, son. Is the blues, blues is that main line now? Yes, it went in the main line, or it's in like that next, I think, as of uh, May. Ah, so that's really recent. It's really recent. Okay. And so it's in tri tri uh, it might be looking already Trump, but not in Chaos Karma? It's definitely not in Chaos Karma, yes. Sorry, it took a while. <laughs> we need to backport it. Uh, we might, and I would like the other stuff to get backported too. Uh, it would be great to go forward, um, and it needs to be further analyzed. And it's very difficult given how noisy these kind of signals are to do a good analysis. I am, by the way, running Minstrel Blues on the. How well has the Babel uh, lecture Wi Fi been working for everybody? So the Babel lecture SSID? That's been working good. Well, that's been running over a Minstrel Blues plus uh, what we call the Minstrel Variance patches uh, all week, and it has been good. I've been collecting some data on it. Um, so I'm very encouraged um, that it actually worked. Um, there's another improvement to Minstrel we found out recently is that it tries to aim, it used to, before this particular patch, which we don't have in the main line, um, it used to try to go for the best average rate. The rate may go up and down, and it would take the average and say, aha, that's the right rate. I should use that one. And uh, it turned out that that worked good for UDP. But in the testing that we did recently, choosing the minimal varying rate not the best average rate, the minimal varying rate, the one that didn't jump up and down as much, worked much better in TCP and in various other connection full protocols. 
In uh, the case of the ath 9 k and almost all the other drivers, we have fixed counters for retransmits. You have 10 stations, you have one that's misbehaving, you might, we're going to say, oh, we're going to try transmitting you 10 times, darn, and starve all the other ones. Where it would make sense to, oh, I have 10 stations waiting, well, I'm going to give up on that bad station a lot sooner than that. So allocating uh, time-based scheduling across all your stations, airtime fairness, um, is a goal as well. And then there's things like selective retransmit. The big thing, now that we have minstrel blues in the main line and we have minstrel variants under test, is to add per station queuing. And it turns out that I do have time for the demo. So if I can get 10 volunteers up here. Okay. All right. I need one person. I only need two people to act as the client eventually, but I only need one to act as the client. Would you be a client? Yes, I'm a client. All right. <laughs> so. Um, Camera-wise, I guess we have a problem with the thing going back and forth. That's not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to probably need ten. Okay. It's great. All right. Now, in olden days, Wi-Fi, WRT 54G, had a four-packet buffer. And it also had this thing that we added for 4 i I'm going to skip 802.11e. So if you guys could be the, be the, you're going to be the Q, okay? I'm going to be the gatekeeper. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm Mr. TX off here. <laughs> okay? And we are going to, uh, you are all packets. I feel like a packet. All right. Uh, we are Q, so. Q, and, and, and packets are going to carry data. So I'm going to ask each of you to step forward, hand your data to, to Simon, and then go to the back of the list. So, boom, hand your data. All right, go back go to the back of the line. Go ahead. Great, keep going. You come, and you, you don't come. Come here and stop. Come here and stop. Now, in the case of Wi-Fi, you might not get an immediate transmission opportunity. Um, you might have to interference. You may have another station in your way, so you have to stay there. And then you can go. Go forward. Now, this works really great. I'm sending data at the right of the media to this person. I have a queue. It's a bit long. Matter of fact, why don't, why don't you all come step forward, all of you, all of you. Great. All right, you go. You go. Mm -hmm. You go. You go. You go. Isn't that great? Now we have, we optimized fully for the link. You go. You go. All right, now stop for a second. <laughs> Everybody behind this line, die horribly. <laughs> die, fall to the ground. Just, just, bleh. Just stay out of the line for a second. You go. You get back in line. You go. You go. You go. <laughs> we are transmitting data now at the exact same rate we were before. Without all those people in line. All right. All right, stop. Go back to the back of the line. You guys get too much fun. All right. Now this is with a standard original Wi-Fi 802.11 GQ, four packets. We have four packets there. Um, if we add aggregation to this, all, uh, at least enough of you to get to, to this edge of the table, all come forward. Okay, awesome. The Wi-Fi Mac is very, very weird. Stop there. <laughs> okay, good. Just so stop at that line. So the Wi-Fi Mac, when we added aggregation still has this clock that goes like this. But what we do is we fit in a whole bunch of packets. Go, three packets! Right, <laughs> boom! Okay, and then we get a couple more. Now we have up to 42 packets. Actually, we couldn't fit them in the room. Three packets, go! Awesome! And we have now achieved 300 meg, go! 
go! <laughs> okay, and we've now, in a single station case, achieved, go, sorry, achieved that 300 megabits on the same clock that we had doing 200 megabits before. Okay, stop. That's cool. <laughs> and almost all of our tests were designed purely for doing bandwidth between one station and one client for the last 10 years. It's everywhere in the industry. Even here at Battlemesh, most of the tests here were not from one station to more than one. I need one more volunteer if a packet would like to become another client. All right, so we have, now we have data and this aggregate queue going to two clients. So, is it Simon or did I say Simon? It's Simon. Simon? All right. So, now we have this really big queue. Let's see. Simon. This is a little hard for one person. I probably should have got there. Simon. I'm doing this wrong. One more time. Let's see here. You're for Toki, but not yet. Stop. Okay. Here. You're also for Toki. Both of you go. Yay, cool. We used an aggregate. All right. I'll go here. I'm sorry. You're for Simon. <laughs> You're for Toki. And if you feed packets randomly, you're for him. You two are for him. You're for him. If you feed packets randomly into a single FIFO aggregating queue, we went from we were utilizing the full queue, 42, in this case four, but 42 packets would go right to him. But the laws of probability mean as soon as you add two clients at the end of that FIFO queue, your aggregation drops to nearly one. And all that extra queue length here becomes delay. So I'm just going to point this way. Go like this. I needed a, uh, where'd, where'd you go? I get in line. <laughs> okay. So um, two guys go to him. One guy to him. One guy to him, one guy to him. I miss multicast. I miss multicast. <laughs> <laughs> Two guys to him, <laughs> one to Toki, etc. Two. Keep going. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well. This is here. <laughs> <It's multicast>. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. <laughs> and that is basically why packet aggregation is currently structured in the current Linux kernel and does not work well. But we need. <laughs> Well, we need to be, you guys can all sit down now. Thank you very much. We need to have a separate multicast queue and control it. And we need to have a, a queue that can aggregate per station. And if we do that, we'll be able to cut the, ten, the hundreds of milliseconds or even a second of delay that we currently see with multiple stations present down to milliseconds. And then we can find further ways of managing the rest of the stuff. I note, it was really remarkable, I've been saying this for five years, four years, and uh, the MU-MIMO stuff came out, which is, gives you four transmitters, and uh, we tested almost all the MU-MIMO products, and they had implemented four queues at the hardware level, which does improve your aggregation slightly, but you had a fifth station, and their performance went to hell. We need one queue per station. Once we get to something really basic, and the code for this landed in March, just a starting point, once we get something basic, it just says one queue per station that we can aggregate, round robin them, make it be, I don't know, two aggregates big, 
we'll see these kind of enormous improvements in latency and performance. But then we can start adding in additional techniques that we've developed called AQM, which is the caudal algorithm, and fair queuing, which is the fair queuing portion of it, which will make it possible for your VoIP packet and your gaming packet and your low latency needing packets to bubble to the front of the queue and always be fast. There's a couple more speculative ideas. A lot of this stuff is really hard to implement. Um, and I'm not really sure about this one. When you have a high speed to a low speed transition, uh, your stations are dumb. You can't necessarily fix those. So you might have a case where you get 30 acknowledgments in a DNS request in a bunch. And it would make sense that the AP, if we were to sort those, to move the DNS request up higher so it goes out sooner. Don't know how to implement that in the ath 9 k but I hope we can in something. There's another uh, thing that has crept into Wi-Fi all over. It's called the reorder buffer. Packets are supposed to arrive in just about any order possible and then be reassembled by the endpoint. Now, it turns out that Windows in particular does a really, really bad job of that. And because most of the benchmarking that was done used Windows, if you had a single packet arrive out of order, it would slow down the TCP flow by orders of magnitude. Therefore, the AP guy said, aha, we'll do additional buffering inside of the driver to make sure we always deliver packets in order, which, of course, adds latency and isn't needed on Linux or Mac or iOS uh, or Android. And since that's over 75% of the Wi-Fi devices in the world, to hell with Windows. Now, I've neglected talking about 802.11.e. It's a little more complex, and I didn't know how much time I would have, and I'm going to skip that. But at least some of these improvements can also apply to station drivers as well. A goal, a really huge goal in our very contended airspace is to try to maximize the number of TX, sorry, minimize the number of TX opportunities that are used up by every station on the network. And there's a lot of cases where you'll see one packet come from a station and then a whole bunch. And it would be nice if they all just came as one TX up, and that does require some driver work. So, uh, I managed to get through almost all my slides. Uh, there is a whole bunch of links to all this stuff, a ton of theory. On this particular one, would anyone like to learn how CODL works, or would you prefer to give me questions on what I've talked about so far? I'll ask. Who wants to ask questions? Questions? The improvements on Wi Fi, it's, I believe it's quite technical question. It's, it's, uh, in the kernel, is developed in the part that is general. Mac 802.11, yes. So it's so, not driver specific, so we'll improve everything without relying on Windows. Okay, very good question. Where um, I do most of my work is off of the theoretical side, not attached to Linux at all. And uh, we have the QDisk side, ab above which um, we have things like FQCODL and CAKE and the other QDisks. And down here we have the Mac. Uh, 802.11 code. We also have the hard Mac stuff, and we have things that look like Ethernet drivers. They're very different interfaces. And uh, because of all the differences between these interfaces, what Felix Feetcow put into the IEEE stack was a way for each individual driver to manage its own queues for per stations. He exposed its per station and the VIF IDs so that down at that layer we can write a driver specific implementation of the core per station algorithms and have that work. And we're pretty sure that that design will work with the ath 5 k ath 9 k and the MT76 chipsets now. It's my hope that a library emerges from that after we make it work. It's, uh, it is some pretty hairy code. Um, is anyone here comfortable programming down at the Mac 802.11 layer? Yes? I would really love to have a chance to, you know, I'm a theorist. I would love to have a chance to work with anyone on trying to get the first bits of the per station queuing portion of this stuff implemented. And after that, maybe it'll get easier.
That stuff terrifies me. There's spin locks and interrupts. There's no MMU. Um, anyway, more questions. Actually, you plan to implement this one, or uh, what's the plan, like bus station queue? I'm sorry, what? No, uh, this is a like, future plan to implement bus station queue. We have planned to take advantage of the hook newly added to Linux okay. to implement per station queuing, probably for the ath 9 k driver first. And who here uses the ath 9 k Because you guys are probably willing to test. Sounds <laughs> good. Actually, our uh, uh, latest Qualcomm implementation, we have already done this uh, bar station queue. Excellent. For any MIMO implementation. And uh, we have a flow control, a uh, peer based flow control mechanism, where uh, the foam bar, uh, the uh, rail foam bar, and the uh, host driver uh, will communicate using a peer flow control. So, this kind of implementation we have done might be it will come on at 11 k Okay, and I look I'm looking in at 11 k so. I really, I've been talking to this, to IEEE, Qualcomm, every Wi-Fi chip maker in the world say, look, if you do this, your stuff will be better. And uh, I'm glad to hear. We have a lot of performance improvement in any case, like uh, yes. uh, As of now, we have been maintaining four queues, four uh, peer based queue, and each queue has a peer control. And we are maintaining a separate queue for uh, multicast packet. So all the scenarios we are talking, we are done as usual. Excellent. Please open source it. It save us some time. <laughs> we only got a billion devices to fix and 300 plus million shipping every year. Cool. Next, anyone else? So, what's about ad hoc mode where we have hidden stations? We uh, noticed in experiments that, especially the minister algorithm, sometimes really breaks down in the presence of there are some things I can't solve with Q-theory. <laughs> the hidden node problem has existed for 20 years. I don't want to have to wait another 30 to solve it, but I, I don't know. And I would like to see it's an avenue of valid research, and if we can come up with better test scenarios for, for um, looking at it harder, that would be great. Well, I was in Paris recently. I could hear over 300 access points from my hotel room. Total bandwidth is measured in tens of kilobytes. The dense mesh problem is going to be everywhere. Anyway, as it is, I don't really have time to go in and how to explain how CODL works. There's a good paper on it. Um, and all I can say is that I know we can make Wi-Fi better. That there are new standards coming out, 802.11ax is the successor to 802.11ac. I gave a variant of this talk to them back in September. The next day, testing for latency under load showed up on multiple of the specification documents for 802.11ax. It's worth the trip. Um, and sometimes I have to say that I'm not really sure if Wi-Fi is worth saving. There are a lot of other standards. We could possibly reuse the frequency for spectrum for different stuff. Uh, it's showing its age. 802.11ad is very interesting. 802.11ak is a new variant that is being developed for data center bridging. It rips out much of what we know about the Mac today and makes it fast. So that might be a, the hardware being developed for that might be a good base for future mesh networks. And then of course there's really cool stuff like uh, the Caruza and maybe sending information over LEDs and stuff like that that are all worth exploring. And I hope that we continue to have a wireless and free internet that anybody can use. Thanks.